It's a monster that's terrified the masses. This animal uh, can hurt everything on in the river. This massive creature is said to be twice the size of an elephant. They talk about an animal between 30 to 70 feet in length. With Long, thin neck, bulbous body, and the heavy tail, the elephant-like legs. An animal thought to have been extinct for centuries. In fact, I think I'd feel safer in Jurassic Park. Now, Monster Quest travels to the wildest continent to search for the last living dinosaur. Whoa. It's all up and down like this. Look at that. What? Wow. What is that? And there are these footprints, uh, huge footprints. Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers. On Monster Quest. Africa, the cradle of mankind. This continent contains some of the world's most magnificent wildlife. From the gorilla and elephant to giraffe and gazelle. Among this vast wilderness, much of it unexplored, some believe there could be a monster that is a living relic hidden deep in the jungle. This huge creature is said to prowl the land and lurk beneath inland waters. Natives call it Michele Mbembe, one that stops the flow of rivers. A heavy armored uh, side scales, uh, a fringe of scales down the back. Footprints of the order of three feet in circumference. He always came out of the cave to, 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 to find foot. The people call this animal Mokeli and Bembe. Eyewitnesses report seeing a creature with a long neck and a snake-like head. They say it has a body as big as an elephant with four legs, claw-like feet, and a long tail. Most of these accounts suggest it is a semi-aquatic animal that spends most of its time in the rivers that run through the jungle. I was afraid because I hadn't seen this type of animal before. Nawuya Bernard, a local fisherman, was preparing his fishing nets along the Deja River when he had a frightening encounter with the creature. The animal was walking in the river. It was long and big. Bernard says it had large, sharp teeth, and its appearance struck him with terror. What I saw were the spines which were on his back. It had a long neck. I was afraid and just run. Witness reports indicate that the animal likely lives in the southeastern rainforest of Cameroon on the west coast of Africa. The largest group of sightings is at the meeting point of three rivers. The area is so remote that few Westerners have ever seen this part of the world or the massive uncharted wilderness it holds. In 55,000 square miles of unexplored jungle, there's just not been anyone around to, to observe the animals, except in the rare cases. Those who have seen the creature say it looks much like this one, a sauropod dinosaur. Sauropods were widespread during the Jurassic period, and fossilized remains have been found on every continent except Antarctica. These herbivores are members of the same family as the Brontosaurus. They had long necks with small heads, big bodies, and claw-like feet, identical to reported sightings of the Mokele Emembe. The creature is said to be an extremely territorial beast attacking those who stray into its territory. But some experts simply don't believe it is possible for such an animal to exist. Well, we know the fossil record of sauropod dinosaurs very well. They actually died out sometime before the rest of the dinosaurs died out. Dr. Donald Prothero is a professor of geology at Occidental College in Los Angeles. He says science by nature rules out their existence. The problem with the Mokele Mbembe idea is that there are several basic zoological facts that have been ignored by the people trying to find it. 
And the biggest problem and the biggest issue that arises not only with this animal, but with things like the Loch Ness Monster as well, is that for an animal like this to exist, there cannot just be one of them. There has to be a large population of them, especially if they've been around, as some people have claimed, for 65 million years. Dr. Prothero says that in order to have survived, there would need to be a breeding population of the animals. If there were a large population of animals this large, we would not have any trouble seeing them, and it would not be something that has such sketchy evidence in support of it. Prothero believes the sightings could be a result of mistaken identity. And they have a very different idea about what is real and what is legendary in cultures like that than we do in Western culture. The professor wants hard evidence before he'll believe. We cannot rely on secondary sources to document something as incredible as these. We have to have physical evidence that's much more convincing. A monster quest expedition to West Africa will try to bring him just such proof. We're looking for a very elusive animal. Cryptozoologist Bill Gibbons has traveled to Africa to search for Mokele Imembe six times in the last three decades. He will lead the team. Now this will be my sixth expedition in total, two to the Congo and four to Cameroon. Researcher Rob Mullen will be joining the team and making his third trip to Africa in search of the creature. I'm not really concerned with whether Western science says that this animal can't exist. I'm more concerned with the fact that all of the local people say that it does exist. Cameroon is about the size of California, with less than half the population. Gibbons and Mullins will travel east from the capital, Yonde, and then south more than 450 miles to Malundu, a town near the Congo border. This is a typical road journey in the dry season. The roads are very hard and congregated, and this is the standard mode of transportation into the south of the country. It's very bumpy and uncomfortable, but it's uh, just a, excuse me. It's practically the only way that we can get to our destination at this point. The trip will take three days because just 10% of Cameroon's roads are paved. The team will be limited to traveling mostly on dirt roads at an average of about 15 miles per hour. This puts a, a lot of people off uh, attempting even just to get into the target area. The team has hired a local guide, Pierre Sima, to help them. Mokwembe Bay is uh, uh, a very big animal, and uh, this animal uh, can hurt everything on in the river. She's an expert animal tracker. Plus, he speaks several different languages, and he's able to translate for us um, from several native languages. He will also help with the numerous government roadblocks that the team will encounter along the way. Well, we were driving through a checkpoint, and uh, we were waved down. It appears that we got a flat tire somewhere on the road back there. It's not unusual on these roads to break down. It's fairly commonplace. While they are broken down, the rains hit. This is the rainy season here, and an average of about 28 inches fall in just three months. The truck slides into a ditch, and the expedition grinds to a halt. And as you can see, our vehicle is jammed at the side of the road, so we're quite concerned about the, the safety factor, uh, as well as trying to get uh, to uh, the final point of our destination. It's very bad, very bad. We are, we are trying to push this car, and we don't know if uh, we, we will allow to, to, to move it. I'm really concerned about getting to where we're going now because the, the road has been turned into mud because of the late heavy rains. The locals pitch in to help get the truck back on the road. We have at least another six hours ahead of us, and that is if the, if the, dro if the road is good. In these conditions and the kind of vehicle that we're driving in, uh, that may not be possible. It takes an hour to get the team rolling again. And now I guess we're trying to decide whether it's worth trying to go on or whether it's just uh, you know, too dangerous to continue down the road. The danger is weighed against the schedule that the team is trying to keep. I would love to reach the target area. I, I don't want this expedition to be called because of rain, but it is, uh, it is obviously a dangerous road when we haven't even gotten five minutes out the door and we're already having to push the vehicle out of the mud. The team pushes on, 
Minutes later, the vehicle again lurches dangerously out of control. Yeah, we're stuck. Uh, we can't make it up the hill. I think this is the end of our road. We tried it again. Uh, it wasn't good enough. The vehicle, this vehicle's not going anywhere fast in this mud. Monster Quest is exploring Cameroon in search of evidence of a living dinosaur that the natives call Mokele Mbembe, the beast that stops rivers. The stories of this creature have been passed down for centuries by village elders. The first known account of the Mokele Mbembe is in a book written in 1776 by Abby Troyard. Dr. Roy Mackle is a retired biologist and is considered the world's foremost expert on Mokele Mbembe. He described what his missionary priests had observed in the Congo. Abby Preyard wrote, it must have been monstrous. The marks of the claws were noted on the ground, and these formed a print about three feet in circumference. The footprints showed three claws, so that the priests knew that could, these could not be made by elephants or hippopotamus or any of that sort of animal. Explorers and traders continued to hear stories of this mysterious monster. In the late 1870s, Englishman Alfred Smith arrived on the west coast of Africa to begin a career as a trader. He later recounted, Behind the Cameroons, there's things living we know nothing about. The Jago Nini, they say, is still in the swamps and rivers. Giant diver, it means. Comes out of the water and devours people. Footprints about the size of a good frying pan in circumference. And three claws instead of five. From all the evidence that we've collected, the only logical explanation is that these are surviving small dinosaurs. In the early 1980s, Mackel made two expeditions to Africa. He was able to collect enough eyewitness testimony to convince him a dinosaur-like creature still lived in the jungle. What impressed me was that the descriptions matched. That is an animal of the order of 25 to 30 feet, uh, 8, 9, 10 meters in length, reddish in color, with a frill on the back of the neck, a long head neck that looked snake-like. Mackle described the animal as reptilian. They described them as being able to submerge as a crocodile would, but being made, uh, they did come out on land most of the time. There just isn't anything like it at all. And now there may be proof. I was in Africa to get pictures of a sauropod. In 2004, science teacher Peter Beach traveled to Africa and discovered what he says is tangible evidence of the beast. They're fairly fresh, probably no more than a week old. Beach found these prints on the bank of a remote river that splits the border of Cameroon and the Congo. He photographed them and preserved them by making plaster casts. The prints were a few feet apart. It was as if the animal had moved up on land in order to eat leaves from the overhanging tree branches. The tracks are in kind of a gravelly sand. They are approximately a foot in diameter, but you can see where there's more than just a foot, uh, toes in other words, uh, perhaps three toes, a foot in diameter, with a heel of some sort. Maybe it's the haunches of the animal or maybe it's part of its foot, I can't tell for sure. Beach found other evidence that a large animal had been in the area. And uh, we looked up and there wasn't any foliage up in, up to about 18 feet up. We measured it just to be sure. And we could see that this animal had cleared out an entire area. Among Africa's indigenous animal population, only giraffes could reach foliage at this height. But there are no giraffes in this part of Africa. Could this be some other animal? According to the uh, locals and to my guide, there 
is no other animal that is quite like this animal. The Monster Quest Science team has obtained these tracks and will subject them to testing for the first time ever. Sauropod tracks are good two or three feet across the big ones, and even the small ones are at least a foot and a half across. Dr. Donald Prothero determines the cast that Peter Beach made in Africa was only one foot across. I look at the photographs here, for example, and it shows what appear to be three parallel scratches in the ground. It could have been claw marks or something, uh, but they don't look anything like a sauropod claw mark. Prothero will need to compare known dinosaur tracks with the casts from Africa to finish his analysis. Sunrise. The Monster Quest expedition team is in Cameroon, West Africa. And the word spreads that outsiders have arrived to look for the monster. They have the most contact or they observe the animal more often than anyone else. The villagers, known as the Baka, are eager to talk to the Westerners about the creature. They draw an image in the dirt of what they've seen. Look at that, Bill. Just to draw with such incredible accuracy, the bulky body, the th between three and five claws, you have the head with the facial features of a python. The locals have virtually no contact with the outside world. And what's so amazing about this is these people have nothing whatsoever to gain from telling stories because we don't pay them. They get no reward from us for doing this. To help clarify their descriptions, Bill Gibbons has brought along a set of pictures. These will help determine if they are able to tell the difference between an elephant and a dinosaur. They live in the forest, so uh, uh, they, 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 can, they can easily see, find the difference between Mukremembe and another type of animal. While Gibbons flips the pages, their guide translates. They don't know a bear or deer, but when Gibbons flips the pages to the drawing of a dinosaur, eyes open and fingers point. This is Mukremembe, which they are, so this is how Mukremembe look. This technique is known to some in the scientific community has comparative observations. Oh, like this. Every time you talk about Mokrembembe to Bakas or to people who live around the river, they, they only describe it as animal with a long neck and a head like a snake. This convinces Gibbons that the sightings are not a case of misidentification. But we've come to the conclusion that this is definitely a different unique animal in its own right. Okay. This woman says she saw the animal while fishing with her husband. The head was like a kind of snake, but it was very long, very long. Dongjal Ture spotted a large animal coming out of the Ja River while out in a boat. I saw this animal trying to eat some leaves. The only part of the animal we saw was the head and the neck. She says her encounter lasted less than a minute, yet left her terrified. The water was churning. The boat was shaking like an earthquake. Everything was shaking in the river. I felt very afraid. Her sighting was of something she could not explain. I've never seen another one since I've lived in the village. The prints being examined by the science team were found by the Ja River in 2004. The river is 450 miles in length and forms the Republic of Congo, Cameroon border. It is fed by both the Bumba and the Ngoko rivers. It's a perfect highway for them. The Congo has long been known as a volatile hotspot for crime and armed militias. With increased dangers, the team must be extra cautious. 
from guerrilla warfare to the local animals uh, to just the hazards of being on an unknown river. Uh, there's always danger involved. The jungle completely surrounds the river, encroaching on every side. Poisonous snakes and deadly crocodiles add to the risk. The team is traveling in canoes used by the villagers, made from hollowed out trees. This increases the chance of a potential encounter. The team heads to the spot where the tracks were originally found. Because this is a place where we find a lot of track of uh, Mokemebe on this part. I'm specialist of uh, a lot, a lot of, uh, um, of many track of animals. I never seen this uh, type of track that day, and it was the first time to see that type of track. The team conducts a thorough search for any new tracks. Let's have a look around, see if we can find somewhere that uh, looks promising. Water, water, wash everything here. It's pretty dry and cracked here, just ant holes. Uh, not much yet. Uh, the water's kind of swept everything out of here pretty effectively. The team sets up a motion sensing camera trap, which will snap photos should the animal return here to feed. Okay, Rob, it's all yours. What do you think? Maybe on this upright tree here? All set. We're ready to go. The boat heads upriver, scouting for other locations. This is a good spot. It's right on the edge of the river, so that we can catch all the action at the right height. Bungees. They place another motion sensing camera. If they do come up to, to feed in that area, uh, presumably they would set off the camera trackers. The team is operating on the theory that the creature hides within natural cave formations. During the dry season, they hold themselves up. It's a kind of reptilian uh, hibernation, you know, where they just cease activity for a while. Frequently, the animals uh, will find a place that's already hollowed out you know, in a bend of the river and just uh, dig in deeper and then wall themselves up. They believe that the animal will stay in the caves until the water level rises. The average size of the caves that we've found so far have been 15 feet by 15 feet. See it there under the, under the bank? You look for a bend in the river primarily, and then you look for uh, piles of, of massed earth. And as we found out, that's mostly on the Congo side. The piles of dirt at the side of the bank may be a sign of the monster digging a cave dwelling and that they could be getting closer to an encounter. They spot something interesting. Because this looks like there's been some activity here. What I'm looking at is these large vent holes. Uh, there's about one, two, three. There's two of them that seem to go quite far back. Gibbons believes the animal not only digs itself a cave, but also makes air vents for it to breathe while inside. He pulls up near shore. We've seen similar events before, which um, we believe are associated with the caves that the animals tend to uh, hibernate in for the duration of the dry season. Wow, that goes way back. That's very, very deep. How thick do you think this cave wall might be, though? Their guide grabs a six-foot-long stick and stretches his arm into the hole. He cannot reach the end of the cave. I think this could be one of the hibernating caves. Monster Quest is deep in the jungles of Cameroon, searching for signs of the last living dinosaur. Natives call it Mokele Mbembe. I saw the Mokele Mbembe when I was very young. Edimo Ferdinand was helping his father with fishing nets when he had a frightening first-hand encounter. I was something like 150 meters away. He watched in both fear and amazement. The animal is like an elephant, but the neck is very long. It's too long. It's a very big animal. When it comes out of the water, it makes a lot of movement on the river. Not only the animal size, 
But the sound that it made terrified the boy. For a few minutes, the animal fed on leaves, then went back into the water. When this animal comes out of the water, you see something like a big splash. The expedition team led by Bill Gibbons and Rob Mullen believe they may have found the beast's hiding place. We cannot think of a single other animal, reptile, mammal that would make burrows like these. Yeah, it's, going, it's still going in. These air vents go quite far down uh, into uh, the side of, of, of this high muddy bank. Quite deep, it seems to be going quite far into the bank, um, especially the one behind me. Clearly, they've been dug out for a purpose. But the walls to the cave are like cement. Without powerful tools, there's no way to find out. Once they're sealed in there, it's very difficult to get them out. It's just a pity we didn't have any other way of finding out what's on the other side of this mud wall. Off we go. The team will continue up the Dujá River. They spot an unusual fish floating in the water. I, I've never seen a fish like that. It has a trunk like an elephant. The team has found a rare elephant fish, unique to this region of Africa. This fish really shows the wide diversity of, of animal life around here. The elephant fish species use their long snouts to sift through river bottom sediment for food. Now the team prepares for an underwater survey of the river. As we have a fish camera, which is a very lightweight and portable, but essential to our work. The camera is disguised as a fish, which you can drop down to about 50 feet. This is a, a lightweight fish finder sonar unit, uh, which gives us the depth of uh, any particular location that we choose to investigate. Uh, we're hoping to locate any large uh, submerged animal. If the sonar spots anything, Gibbons hopes to film it with a camera. Ready? I'm still checking. Uh, drop it a little more into the water. It doesn't take long before they get a hit. Is that a crocodile? Yeah, it looks like a croc, yeah. It's very big, whatever it is. I'm trying to get down as, as low as I can here. I'm hitting the bottom slightly. OK, we have another large target at the bottom here. That, look, that looks like a croc. That's a croc. Crocodile? Yes. It was long and serpentine, whatever that it was. That was a very, very big target. Huge. May not even have been a crocodile. No, you know, that, there's so that many first... strange animals in this river. Yeah. So many strange animals. What depth do we have? We have 6.0 here. Uh, OK, right. I've let out too much cable. See this tub, this, 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 see this, what is this? Hmm? Yes. Do you think that might have been a snake? Maybe, but this is very long and big. What have you got? I don't think I want to meet up with that snake. It makes you wonder what's right under, right under you. I mean, it's not that deep, but we're seeing all sorts of odd, odd profiles on the fish finder. This tuna is, uh, is perfect because you can see very far. Here, look at this, look, look, we have something. We have something. Oh, wow. Fish. Whoa. What that is... is a very big target. Look at the size of that thing. They are having a hard time getting a clear picture in the murky water. And at six feet. Look at it. The storm they encountered on their journey here has stirred up the river bottom. It's uh, very discolored. It's, it's like trying to find something in a, in, a, in a swimming pool full of chocolate milk. Okay, here we go, here we go, here it is again. Yep, there's another big one, big hump. This, this cannot be a branch. No? Very long. I, may, I don't know which type of uh, things can be, but, but it seems like a, a very, very long animal. I've not, seen, uh, I've not seen that profile any other time than now. They cannot stop without starting the motor. Any noise could scare the creature. They are forced to simply drift. Another serpentine shape coming wow, up. Wow, look at that. Mm, 7.8, and here we have another strange profile. What does this look like? Look at that, look at that hump. 
Very big, very strange. What is that? No, oh, no, we have two in a row. <laughs> oh, what is this? Uh oh. What is this? That can't be the bottom. It's not the bottom. What is that? See. Si. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, Something just passed the God. camera. My God. See. Si. I'm trying to. I'm trying to get a bit lower here. The creature, whatever it was, disappears from the sonar's view. And here we go. <sighs> Something dark yeah. just loomed up at the camera and then went off. But this look like very long snake. See this bottom? Yes. It's empty. Yes. Hmm? Why? The team tries to make sense of what they just saw. We saw some fascinating profiles. I, I really don't know yes. how to identify them. We've, uh, some of them might have been tree branches. Some of them might have been serpentine. Um, and we noticed that when these, these larger objects, which are clearly not debris in the water, but obviously animate objects of some kind, um, there's no fish around them, which is interesting. Something that just went on and on and on for for several feet, but it was they were very difficult to to define. It's hard to tell what it was. It tells me that there are quite a few mysteries on this river to be explored further. We weren't able to get any video this time. Uh, we do need to spend more time here though on the river. Okay, let's bring it in, guys. The team heads back to camp. They'll be preparing for a nighttime observation in a place locals call. The Forbidden Zone. The natives say it's forbidden to go there because uh, it's a location where they encountered uh, the Mokeli and Bembis on a number of occasions. Monster Quest is in the heart of Africa searching for the last living dinosaur. The territorial amphibious creature lives in the oh, rivers like here wow. and has been known to attack humans. The tradition of the pygmies especially is that if anyone sees a Mokele and Bembe and then reports or talks about it, he will surely die. Dr. Roy Mackle met many locals during his search for the creature. They warned him of the dangers of his quest and that should he encounter difficulty, they would not be able to help him. You go right ahead, but remember, we will not even send up a body bag to bring you back. They have long passed on the legends of these frightening and mysterious creatures that prowl the water's edge. He was eating leaves and the branches were falling in the water when he was eating. Nanga Norbert was fishing one night on the Dja River when he saw the creature. Even in the dark, he could tell this was not an elephant or rhino. With something like spines on his back, long neck, long tail, it's difficult to tell how big the animal was. It was dark and the neck was so long that I was afraid and I just ran. Norbert turned his boat around and left the area. He was scared for his life. This animal has a reputation of breaking canoes, and he kills people. The expedition team led by Bill Gibbons and Rob Mullen are embarking on a dangerous nighttime search for this living dinosaur. We're looking at night because we've seen a lot of uh, confirmation in the eyewitness reports that the animal is active at night, generally feeding on the leaves surrounding the river. The danger is everywhere as Africa's predators okay. are mostly nighttime hunters. The team will ride in a larger and sturdier canoe to help prevent them from tipping over. It's a little bit um, unnerving but being on the river in the dark with lots of crocodiles around, but uh, you know, you've got to be a little adventurous if you want to be successful. To help them with their search, they enlist local villagers. We know far less about these animals than the native people do. So we take their advice whenever we do go into a location where the animals are said to be present. A full moon will help as well. Mostly seeing shoreline, seeing some trees, not seeing much in the water. It's pretty calm at the moment. Uh, any signs of surface disturbance, any, uh, any signs of the animal eating at the edge of the water? is uh, what we're looking for. They'd be right up uh, inside the tree line uh, among the foliage, um, browsing on the leaves. 
they stay close to shore for safety. People have been traveling down the river at night in their canoes, and they've literally ran into Mokeli and Bembi's feeding. So we're trying to be as quiet as we can, just drifting with the current to see if we might just spot a feeding Mokeli and Bembi. That would be something if we can. We have a little moonlight tonight helping us in our search. Visibility is pretty good. I can see all the way to the shoreline here. I'd say these are ideal conditions. The water is very quiet. The river is very calm. Uh, no sounds, so we can easily hear any disturbance. As is common in this part of Africa, a storm arrives and builds quickly, forcing them off the river. There seems to be a storm coming in right now. It's been moving across in the Congo for quite some time. It's uh, closing in on our position fairly quickly, so we need to get off the river and get back to camp uh, before we get caught in the storm. We didn't hear anything of note, a lot of bird sounds and a few fish splashing in the river, but apart from that, no major activity. Well, it was very, very quiet. Um, not even crocodiles tonight, surprisingly. Uh, usually there are a few crocs out at night but a very peaceful, calm night on the river. Daybreak, and the team is back on the hunt. What can you see on the sonar? Right now, just small fish. Yeah. We're at the bottom here, so I'm trailing down as close to the bottom as I can to see if we can identify some of these larger profiles that we've been hitting from time to time. In just minutes, Large, unidentified objects begin appearing on the sonar. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. Whoa. It's all up and down like this. Look at that. Yeah. That could be a neck and a, a, a large body. I don't think that this is a branch. No. This is a solving mystery. Look at this. That is a very big target. What is that? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Trouble is, it's so milky down there, I can't see anything on the camera. The river bottom has been stirred up by the rains. Some very unusual profiles in the water. Um, some of them fairly bulky, um, obviously some of them very long and snake-like. Once or twice we thought we caught sight of a, a more of a bulky body with a long slender neck attached to it. A couple of times we got that. Unfortunately, it's almost impossible to get good video from this, from this river. The team decides to make the move toward the Bumba River. We're heading there because there's been some very recent activity on that river regarding Mokili and Bembe. My understanding is some within the last few months. The Monster Quest science team has been analyzing the tracks said to have been made by the last living dinosaur. The large beast is thought to be from the sauropod family. The sauropod's toes are all three really close together, and these are widely spaced. The known tracks of sauropods seem to be unlike those found in Cameroon. The sauropods, some of them weighed up to 40 or 50 tons, so when they stepped on the ground, especially soft ground, they would leave impressions they were two feet deep in some cases. Well, there actually are well-preserved sauropod trackways in several places. The most famous is in the Glen Rose Limestone in Paluxy River, Texas, where there's a series of very large uh, sauropod trackways. Some are so large, there's actually shots of kids back in the 1930s sitting there and taking baths in them. Dr. Prothero points to scientific dating of these tracks, which indicates they went extinct 65 million years ago. I think it's extremely unlikely that Mokelion Bobembe exists. The fossil record does not support the idea that sauropod dinosaurs were around for the last 140 million years in Africa, and we have an excellent fossil record to show that. Science is not about absolutes. Science is about probabilities. We never say never in science, even for things that are extremely improbable. Monster Quest is searching the jungle of West Africa for a living dinosaur known to natives as Mokele Mbembe. Sightings go back generations and suggest a large-bodied creature that has a long neck, small head, and long tail. This teacher says he collected footprints of the beast. This woman said that when the creature moved, the whole river shook. These men are on a search to collect video evidence of the monster. And this expert dismisses the possibility that a living dinosaur still exists. Some of the most recent activity was on the Bumba, so we're hoping that just maybe, uh, considering the fact that the rains have stayed late into the dry season, there might still be some activity in, on the river. The expedition team is searching the area of recent sightings. All three rivers are interconnected. 
and uh, this apparently uh, is a migration route for the Mokele and Bembe. The Bumba runs along the border of the Republic of Congo and poses a much greater risk than the Ja. The plan on the Bumba will be similar to that of the Ja. The team will head up as far as possible and then float silently back down using the sonar and underwater camera. So uh, good equipment all around. This time they will focus on the deep water pools where they believe the animal could be hiding. They would appear as a, just a, a large dark object, possibly with a certain contours, such as a long neck or a long tail. Right now we're, we're just passing over some slightly shallow water, three to four feet deep on average. Um, lots of silt on the bottom of this river. Not too many fish around. I'm pretty sure we'll start encountering more marine life as soon as we hit the deeper water. Okay, 12 feet. Get ready. So we'll keep trawling the river here to see if there's anything interesting that we might be able to stumble upon. This is a little like fishing without bait. They will drift slowly down the river. It's the best way to find the animal without scaring it away. As we know what fish and crocodiles tend to look like on sonar, we're looking for something more unusual. At this point, we're doing everything that we can to find its habitat and uh, locate it that way. Right now, we're averaging seven feet. We want to find something 20 feet plus in depth. We're hoping that the sonar can see what the eyes cannot. The water level has been pretty shallow, not surprisingly this time of year, but this doesn't do as much good. We are hoping to get into much deeper water. Uh, Pierre, it's a bit shallow here. Can we, can we motor down towards the confluence of the Ngoko? So that way we can... In hopes of finding deeper water, they will move the boat closer to the headwaters of the Bumba and the Jaw. 12 feet, 15 feet. Okay, okay, stop. There's a big object here, fairly big, drifting along. Drop it right in, Rob. The plan to move to deeper water seems to be working. What's this? Look at that, look how long that is. The water is, is very dark and murky. Hang on, what's this? What's that? I don't know. Yeah, it's not quite... Look at this! Look at, look at this! The object quickly disappears. They decide to turn around and give it another look. We'll go back in the middle here. Yeah? So as I say, drop it in, drop it in, okay? Because we're coming, we're coming back down to that same location. Drop it in now. The team has zeroed in on a possible target. But then, another problem. Right on the border here, guys. 10 feet of water, yes. We don't want to go any closer to the Congo. The team is exactly where they want to be on the river. But just 100 feet away is the border with the dangerous Republic of Congo. Problem is we're getting a little bit too close to the Congo side. We don't want to get too far over the front. This is what they call the Frontier River. Uh, because it could cause uh, more sorts of complications for us. We're at a deep part of the river, 15 feet, but we can't stay here because it's uh, politically sensitive. Gibbons and Mullen believe the major reasons why this animal hasn't been found is the remote location and the threat of searching in such a dangerous area. Yes, we have to go. Okay, let's go. They are very close, but cannot take the risk. They reluctantly head back to camp. On the way back, they collect the camera traps. I am anxious to see what's on these because you never know what will turn up next. We'll see what we can find. Motion 44, picture three of three. So we have gotten some pictures in here. They examine them, but no unusual animals have been picked up on the cameras. This Monster Quest expedition has made some interesting discoveries. Hits on the expedition team's sonar indicated there are large, unknown, serpent-like animals that live beneath the waters here. They also located a cave system that they believe may be the hibernation grounds for an unknown creature. And the science team determined that footprints taken here in 2004 were not those from a living dinosaur. We're getting closer all the time, and who knows, the next expedition we might get some film. There were some long serpentine things that were a little hard to define. So we, we would like to go back and uncover some of those mysteries. And a sauropod dinosaur dome is a hard thing to miss, and there's no sign that there's been any dinosaur in Africa in the last 65 million years. The Mokele and Bembe identification is a matter of conjecture. 
But all the descriptive material that we've been able to accumulate suggests that we are dealing with a small sauropod dinosaur.